is the mic still working? No, I can. Um, now? Great. Uh, so, yes, my name is Marissa Fagan, and I am here to talk about the cool factor, security's secret weapon. Um, and the only thing not cool about this talk will be the person trying to define what cool is. Um, but before I jump into it, I just wanted to find out who's in the audience. Is anyone here a security awareness program manager or practitioner? Awesome, awesome, great. Yeah, you can be more than one thing, it's okay. Is anyone here a pen tester? Does anyone that's a pen tester call themselves red team? Not so much here, okay. Um, anyone a developer? Awesome, great, great, okay. So who am I? I am a security culture ex expert, self-described, um, community builder, a classically trained commuter and computer information system specialist. Uh, I am an art enthusiast, and I have been interested in hacking culture since I was probably 15, but officially in the scene got my cred when I went to DEF CON 11, um, what was that, 14 years ago. So I've been making uh, an interest of hacking culture for a really long time. Uh, this is not a picture of me, but I think that me and Rene Descartes have a lot in common. Uh, Descartes is famous for saying, I think, therefore I am. And I am also famous for saying, I, what is it? Um, I am what I think is cool, is what I say. Uh, so humble beginnings, uh, not just for myself, but for the hacking culture scene in general. Um, when I was about 15, I was in school, and I got my first exposure to the hacker scene when somebody that I was in school with brought the 2600 Hacker Quarterly magazine to school, and we got to see for the first time the um, different hacks and tricks that people were doing around that time in the mid-90s um, just to kind of crack codes and do cheats a little bit. Um, it's just some interesting things to do, how to get free phone calls. And I thought that this was the coolest thing that I had ever seen. So I wanted to get into it, find out more about it. And since then, I've been thinking a lot about what makes the security scene cool. Um, but what I loved most about 2600 Magazine was on the back cover, they had a picture of different telephone booths from around the world. Um, the, one of the motivations for the magazine was talking about freaking. So this different, um, just a different perspective where everyone knows what a phone booth is and it was this way to access what hacking culture was and realize, realizing that maybe you know more about hacking culture than you think because you have all of these other frames of reference around like what is a phone, how do phones work, I know all of that, so if I just add this one thing then maybe I know a couple hacks as well. So I thought that was really cool. And I never stopped taking pictures of phone booths and sending them into, I don't think 2600 collects pictures anymore, but uh, I took this picture yesterday, kind of excited about the weird and interesting looking phone booths that still exist. Uh, so hacking culture, still um, talking about around the late 90s or so, um, a lot of people got their experience with finding hacks based on trying to do something else. So you weren't trying to be a hacker, you were trying to get free internet from AOL. And a lot of us found our way through um, the multiple avenues that you could send content and send hacks to AOL versus, you know, through the URL bar, or through chat, or through all of their different web pages. Um, so that was one of the first things that I noticed. Uh, a broad majority of the uh, culture of people were getting exposed to hacking without actually realizing what they were doing. Uh, another thing that I noticed a lot of my friends doing in the, in the 90s that was actually hacking was they were trying to make their MySpace page look cool by doing all sorts of little code snippets that they were inserting into their profile page and then would interact with users in a way that wasn't necessarily endorsed by MySpace, but people were figuring these things out on their own. And because the landscape was op open, they were able to add stuff that was uh, maybe a surprise. Um, so if you remember, uh, Sammy Kamkar was able to 
create a worm, he was not intentionally trying to take down MySpace, but actually trying to add a code snippet to his page that would talk to visitors to his page and then add something to their page if they were logged in. Uh, it created the first viral worm on a social media account and um, affected millions of people. Those millions of people were regular MySpace users that were then exposed to hacking culture. And from that point forward, we're able to see what is possible and also what is maybe not possible about what hackers can do to a website. Uh, so great exposure early on. Another thing that I just uh, thought was so interesting in uh, the early days of uh, the consumers being introduced to hacking culture was this thing called Magic Jack which before voice over IP was a popular consumer item, there, were, there was this gadget that you could buy that would basically get you free phone calls, and the consumer was like, hey, cool, neat, how does this work? Like, I'm normally paying for phone calls, but now I guess I have to pay only one-tenth of the cost, and it was basically creating a DSL connection to a phone number, and before DSL was really being um, introduced widely as a consumer good, people were testing out just this one little thing, and based on my knowledge of I know how phone calls work, now I also know how connections via voice over IP work. So people know more than they think, and I think all of this stuff is really cool. Uh, but as we all know, the coolest of cool in 1995 was the movie Hackers. And um, I think the, the Spanish on this DVD says, you think your secrets are safe, but they're not. Um, and my, one of my introductions to hacking culture came from this movie. I watched it one million times. Um, but just to point out if we can sort of break it down and define why Hackers the movie was so cool, it's because it took something that we recognize, which is uh, teenager culture, movies, fashion, uh, interesting movies, Hollywood, and then married it with something that we're not so familiar with, which is where, for the most part, the consumer we're not aware of how hacking worked, but it introduced these two things in a way that was easily digestible for the mainstream culture. So uh, moving down the line to current day, we have more hacking in culture. Um, we've got, uh, our Hollywood has shown us more and more increasingly technical Hollywood hacker characters. And the most recent one, uh, Mr. Robot, is very popular. And um, actually, members of our community are actually the um, technical advisors for this show. So you, you might have some, some critique of it, but there's actually a few very technical elements to it that expose the normal, average, everyday consumer to hacking culture. Um, interestingly, the show Black Hat, the movie Black Hat, Chris Hemsworth is such a famous movie star that average, everyday people are going to see this movie about hacking, and subconsciously they're learning about payloads, backdoors, and remote access tools. And um, I've, I've, I'm fascinated by the movie Black Hat because they create this rat as almost like a character in itself, and you have to find the rat and protect yourself against the rat, and what's, what's happening with the rat? And so now everybody knows this term. Um, but what we, what we can take away from this is that hackers in movies are being portrayed to the popular culture as people that will either save the day or end the world. There are people that have skills beyond the average person's grasp, and they do things that look kind of like magic. They're uh, also, what we want our average person to know is that um, computers are everywhere, this mindset that is only recently being adopted with IoT is actually something that's been being said all along. In the fictional world of hacker movies in Hollywood, uh, we've been telling people all along that any device can listen to you, that you can turn on anything and have it become a microphone and send back, you know, that these things that are now IoT have been all along exposed to the consumer, and there's been a subconscious distrust in, um, in a skepticism about privacy, about your gadgets, for quite some time. Um, and also, we want our, uh, our consumers to have a understanding that uh, hackers are, in Hollywood's frame of reference, that they're anti-corporate. And so, for our purposes today, we're going to be talking about our employee security awareness program 
that we want people to know that um, this is the adversary that they are up against. And just the more understanding, the better you can protect yourself. Also, we want, uh, we want our employees to know that hackers have a curious mindset, and that curiosity is something that will inform them that they will probably be using an unexpected avenue, think outside the box. These sorts of things are uh, not going to be the normal ways that gadgets and technology is meant to be used. It's going to be the opposite. So these things have been taught subconsciously to uh, consumers for quite some time. And of course, security is in the news. Just quickly to remind everyone just exactly how much exposure to hacking and breaches and protect yourself, protect your privacy. I mean, this stuff is happening every day. I had a list that was the entire page of all of the recent breaches, but um, I took it out because I think we all, know, you know, we don't need to name call, but everybody has had some sort of uh, incident that has affected them as a consumer. So. Point of sale systems are a major point where consumers can feel an I identity with the um, security of a system and they are directly affected. Identity theft is something that directly affects the consumer and the more that they take on the themselves an understanding of how that works, the more they will benefit and be a better uh, employee at your company. Um, so the, the next, the, just the last piece of this is um, we like to poke fun or criticize the new uh, vulnerability logo phenomenon, but these things do create an, um, they create an accessible way for the consumer to learn about and know about vulnerabilities. So Heartbleed, the logo actually did have quite some benefit in creating a way to access the vulnerability for the average consumer. And the same goes with the classic anonymous mask. All of this is classic marketing techniques to help the consumer identify with security. Uh, so just to back up a second and define some terms, what is culture? Culture is recognizable, it's pervasive, meaning all over the place, and it is behaviors and values. Culture is endorsed by top leadership, but it's driven and run by the majority, by the bottom largest audience, in, in our case today, the employees of a company. So in a company, if you combine security and culture, you get something that we call the security culture program. And this is a methodology that I'm going to go over with you today that is incorporating what people already know about security and using that as a way to, um, to provide access to things that we want them to know about security. So on the top it says that one of the three parts of a culture program is what employees recognize and already know. Another part is what employees like and want. And the last part is the most important for your um, ROI is conveying what you need employees to know. So uh, at the bottom it says you could do a culture program with any two, but three is better. For example, you could have a um, a campaign that has your what you need employees to know and what the employees already know, so a training that tells them what they know and what you want them to know, that's a very dry training. It doesn't really get a lot of leverage, uh, it doesn't get a lot of buy-in, so people are gonna mostly ignore it. But if you have this third element, which is examining what about your culture do people like? What are the things that normally get people excited about? and then put that into your trainings, then you've created a solid program. So similarly, you could tell people what they like and also tell them what they already know, and then you've just wasted your time. You've had a successful program about something that they already know, like you should lock your computer screen, great. And so you want to be strategic about what you're doing and making sure that you have a good idea of what people already know and what they need to know. So a security culture program is building on uh, the employee's baseline knowledge and experiences about security. It's intersecting pop culture, safety, and business experience that they have already. It is not just security awareness. I know there's been a lot of um, great talks this week about security awareness programs, and I would just like to present this uh, security culture program as one step more holistically, a broader scope of different uh, techniques and programs that are 
including security awareness, that are part of the broader spectrum of the security knowledge and behaviors of a company. The security culture program is a broad program for all employees at a company, usually um, involving a, um, something that all employees need to do. But there are subcultures as well. So we've heard a lot about subcultures for engineers, such as security champion programs. And we can also have subcultures that are based around sales, subcultures based around the operations or infrastructure of the company and also um, basically any sort of small or very small grouping of people that share set a set of common values and behaviors. So this slide is kind of a long one, and stop me if you have any questions. So the security culture program has several components, and with all of these components built together, you will have a comprehensive security culture program. The first one is training. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about training because it's quite a rabbit hole and we could talk all day and many other presenters this week have done some fantastic talks about training, uh, specifically like Security Champions and the BELT program that Adobe has and also um, different ways to teach developers how to do secure coding, um, OWASP Top 10, all of these things are incorporated into a training program. Uh, one of the things I will add that I don't think has been mentioned yet is that once you have your uh, training program in an expansive capacity, you can also decrease the size of your annual compliance-driven security awareness training. So that training that all employees have to take that's 30 to 60 minutes long, by creating a more cohesive, broad program, you can actually slim that down to almost nothing. And that's one way to get all the employees at your company to really like you and to be aware that there is a program in the security department that has their best interests in mind, and it's a good introduction to how your company is going to be doing security culture. So rethink your security, um, your annual compliance-driven security awareness training program. The second thing is ubiquitous marketing. Uh, I call this an ambiance of security. You'll, you need to have a communications plan, um, and often there's a marketing element to this. Often there's uh, posters on the walls of your office that say uh, a common one is like the campaign around see something, say something. So just a short slogan. Um, that's part of the communication strategy for the security culture program. Um, another thing that comes in at this point under um, communications is your reporting technique. So how do employees talk to you about security problems? Is there a form that they fill out? Do they have to email you? Is there a security at domain.com that they email? Is that separate? Um, so what is the experience if somebody wants, what's the friction to report something? And we're going to talk about reporting a little bit later as well. The next thing is incentives. So incentives could be just about anything. And for every company, it will be different. Uh, incentives doesn't necessarily have to be monetary, and it doesn't necessarily have to be t-shirts. Uh, I know in my company in San Francisco, we love t-shirts and we collect them uh, for just about everything, but uh, t-shirts maybe isn't necessarily what your company is into. Um, maybe what your company is into is uh, recognition certificates, um, credentials, maybe it's um, working towards promotion and um, that sort of thing. So just know that everybody's different and figure out what works for your company. Um, the next thing is executive leadership. Um, one of the classic examples of this I like to tell is about Microsoft starting the Trustworthy Computing Program. This started with the memo from Bill Gates, the memo on trustworthy computing, where he told all, all of the members of this company that we were no longer going to be um, a company that doesn't, I, I can't remember exactly the words, but basically he said, now we are a company that cares about shipping secure code and we want our customers to trust our product. So this was a mandate set from the top, from the very top with the CEO, and it trickles down to everyone in the company because now we're all on the same page and we know that uh, security is our number one value. The next thing, in a, the next component of a security culture program is the role-based niche groups. Um, once again, I'm not gonna go into, uh, as I, 
had planned before I arrived this week. I'm not going to go into what a security champion program is. Um, I'm really excited to see that there have been a lot of different talks this week that have kind of touched on how to run a successful champion program where you have advocates in teams amongst your groups that are basically um, providing extra security content to other employees and getting people excited about security. But what I will mention is that there are other niche-based groups that deserve a similar kind of strategy. So executives, for example, are their own niche group that require a special executive-based program. Um, executives have different security concerns and also different levels of risk tolerance that they need to adhere to. So having a program that gets executives even excited about implementing security uh, needs to be handled in its own special way. Uh, the last thing is actually the first thing. Uh, the most important thing is measurements. So having metrics about whether your security culture program is successful is going to be what gets you to have the uh, buy-in and the budget to continue the program in the future. So for measurements, there's lots of different things that you can measure. Um, there's often this concept that uh, measuring culture is impossible, but actually it's quite easy. You just have to consider it in um, sort of di in some specific ways. For example, um, we measure how many reports we get per year. We measure how many phishing attempts are reported, that for example. Um, we also measure how many people are taking our trainings. We measure whether those people that have taken trainings are um, committing more or less bugs. So bug attribution is another metric that we do. Um, <coughs> We also have, um, sorry, so there are, there are plenty of metrics that you can measure, but one of the most important things, and the reason I say that measurements is first as well as last, is because before you start measuring, you should establish a baseline. It's quite hard to uh, measure something and uh, track it to the root cause if you do it before you get a baseline. So be sure to get a baseline measurement of the behavior that you're trying to solve for before you start trying to change it. So for those of you that said that you were pen testers, this is how I hope that you can access this talk. Uh, the security culture program is the, the red team or the pen testers best friend. And I would encourage those of you that are actually a consultant pen testing com for a con pen testing company to think about one of the audiences for your work is actually going to be these uh, security culture program practitioners that are going to use your work to identify which behaviors from employees that they need to change. So future penetration tests can become another kind of metric to measure how successful we're being. For example, if the penetration test involves a phishing email. Our goal is to make phishing as expensive and difficult as possible because our employees are savvy and they will not be phished. So maybe the next penetration test you do next year, you don't even bother with phishing because that's too time consuming and it doesn't prove the point you're trying to prove anyway. That's a win for our security culture program. So if those are the sorts of things that you can convey in your report, it would be helpful for more than one audience. Uh, now to discuss root cause analysis. So security starts and ends with behaviors. And in order to do root cause analysis, you're going to ask the question why, and maybe you'll ask it five times. So for example, you have been told in your, uh, your red team exercise or your penetration test report that people are more vulnerable at home because they're accessing their personal emails um, they're accessing them through home and they're not using the VPN. So you might ask your employees, why are you checking your personal emails at home using your work computers, not using the VPN? And they'll say something like, well, because I want to get my email, I want to check my email and I can't do it. And you'll say, why can't you do it? And they'll say, because I w when I'm at work, I'm having to uh, log in three or four times, the, my session expires too soon, and it's a pain, so, and you'll say, well, why is it a pain? And they say, because it's, uh, because I have to log in so many times, I don't get as much work done as I do at home, so I'd rather work at home. And actually, what they're doing is sidestepping a security protocol, because by working at home, they don't have to log into the VPN. 
right? This is something that probably everybody is familiar with. Um, we all try to create conveniences for ourselves by sidestepping security protocols. And what you might have started off as thinking the behavior change is getting people to stop checking their personal emails by asking why over and over, you realize what you actually need to do is change the session time for your logins, for your credentials at work, and then people will stay at work and do their work stuff at work and not do as much of it as home, at home where they don't have to do the login. So you can actually see that the behavior is something not quite as simple as, uh, you know, people don't know, they're not supposed to do that. Uh, so as a side note, before you do any behavior change method, you should always ask yourself, is this something that can be solved with technology first? Is this a, a filter or a policy that we can change with technology instead of doing a behavior change, which is much more expensive and lengthy? So at this point, I just wanted to pause and ask anybody if they had any questions about security culture programs. I have some more slides after this that are as I promised, fun slides about cool t-shirts. Um, but I don't think there's really any questions to ask about that, so I just wanted to ask if these slides brought up any questions about security culture, security culture program methodology, and I thought we could take a few minutes now instead of at the end for questions. Uh, so the question is, uh, for doing the five whys exercise, for figuring out the behavior, once you've narrowed it down to something that becomes maybe difficult to fix, um, how hard is it to get executive buy-in to fix something that's perhaps fundamental? Um, so for executive buy-in, you know that you have it from the start. That's the first thing you do. You get executive buy-in on, uh, on a values level, and you say, you, you try to get to the point where the security team has the leverage that it needs to do the job that it needs to do. And then we start talking about AWS. And um, so it is possible that if you've come to a roadblock, you can make it even more simple by asking more whys. So if it's about AWS, is there something that we could use instead? Is something about the, is there a different way to go about it that the executives will endorse and then um, just making sure that they're partners all along the way and reminding them that this was their idea, that they actually want this. Yes? Um, can you uh, speak much about measuring the impact of security uh, culture programs on employees and how they're working in their own companies? Do you have examples of how you can actually do that? So um, the question is for measuring the impact of security culture program. Are, are there any examples of ways that we've been able to um, measure our impact? Um, so one of the things that I mentioned is rethinking the security awareness program, uh, security awareness training that we do annually. And while we were having, um, I don't recall the exact numbers, but they were around 85% uh, completion of the training in a set amount of time before, we were able to change that to 100% completion of the training by just changing the training around and uh, thinking about the ways that our company likes to do trainings and making it more in line with our culture. Um, another example is around getting our security champions ad adopted. So we have measured how many of our teams have given, have volunteered security champions and been able to iterate based on what was popular. We have narrowed down our champion program so that once again, an adoption rate, we have increased our number of champions to in the hundreds, whereas before it was a uh, quite stagnant program. 
by interviewing them and finding out what it is that they wanted to do, how they would run the program if they were to do it themselves, and just having that partnership and buy-in with your audience. And that's how you figure out the, the three questions that we'll com keep coming back to, which is what, do, what is your audience like? What do they already know? And what is the, base, the basic version of what you need them to know? Uh, the question is, what are some mistakes that we've made along the way with our, um, with refining the security culture program methodology? What should you not do? Um, one of the things that we learned the hard way was taking on too much too soon. So having the program be one piece at a time is very important. So our team is uh, quite large for a security culture program. We have six people. And so we all took something and started doing six things. Um, that, that was not the way to do it. So um, I think you have to pick one behavior and then pick one way to solve it and pick a baseline and the, uh, measure a baseline and then be able to have a clear cause and effect to your actions and through measurement, then you're able to see how you're effective. Uh, we learned those things the hard way. One more? Yeah, um, how long did it take you to go from having this pretty basic program to creating such a culture where it's embedded? So you, you never yeah, stop. You, um, let's go back to this slide. Oops. That's terrible. So you can see here on this slide, uh, I realize the font is much smaller than I realized. Um, it says that you have the bottom 10% of people that will never do the engagement thing that you're asking them to do no matter what. And those 10%, you can sort of, in the beginning, write off and know that you're not going to reach them. The middle 80% is the middle of your bell curve. Those are the people that want to be led. They, they need to know what it is that's required of them and they need to know what their incentives are. And once you let them know what their incentives are and what's required, they're happy to do what it is that you're asking. And so those people are always going to be told um, what to do, and that never stops. So you can never say, like, this is security culture, and just let it run free. It's always an active pushing process. And then you have the top 10%, which is your high performers, and those people are going to be your security champions. They're going to be your executive leaders that are bought in and are uh, championing for you at a higher level. And those people are going to be always working with you no matter what you do. And so those people are always going to be excited about it. Um, but that, part, that portion is only 10%, so you would never stop um, with the security culture program. You would never stop growing it. So to go back to what you do with the lowest 10%, those people that would never work with you no matter what you do, um, one of the suggestions that we have is to do something called a risk acceptance form. So it's a form that you fill out. It's a tangible agreement that you've made that by doing this behavior or by accepting this technology or by doing this process, you're accepting the risk that is involved with that. And we've had a lot of um, a lot of success with one of our other metrics, which is how many people are actually accepting the risk and signing a risk acceptance form. Um, that number goes down over time. So that's uh, something to look out for as well. So I think, is that, yeah, that's good. Um, is there any more questions? One more question. Well, it's, uh, so your question is, 
is it easy for Salesforce and companies like ours to get uh, security culture program buy-in because we advertise security as one of our uh, core features. We talk about security all the time, so obviously security is going to be easy for us to sell. Um, but is it difficult for companies like banks uh, to have security culture programs because they don't have because they don't have to be secure, There's or they have other priorities. Uh, so that just uh, the answer to that is that has not been my experience. I have uh, spoken with uh, practitioners amongst companies of all sizes and industries, and it's actually true that all companies have a culture, and all companies can build a security awareness. Um, it can build a security culture program out of that culture. So that was sort of the point that I was trying to make by showing you how much of Hollywood and how many things the consumers are exposed to. If you're having trouble getting traction of security, uh, security culture programs in particular as a business driver, then one of the other ways you can approach it is by appealing to employees on a personal level. So if you can't get uh, your CEO to say that security is our number one value, you can appeal to the drivers from below your employees and say, you know how you use security at home? You know how you keep your family secure? How you have all of this awareness about security in your personal life? Can we apply those exact same techniques and protect our company in the same way? And those sorts of things are just, uh, it's just an awareness campaign. It doesn't cost money. We're not talking about um, expensive swag marketing sorts of campaigns. Um, in fact, I've seen banks in particular, to your point, that are not allowed to give t-shirts or swag because it's a, uh, it has value. And so they can only do uh, incentives that are not uh, of value and only about recognition and like telling the managers that they've done a good job or certificates of achievement. So it's uh, definitely possible in any size in any industry company. It just requires getting creative. OK, so let's talk about cool t-shirts. Can everyone see which t-shirt this is? I think this is the most famous cool t-shirt in the hacker culture. It's the um, make me a sandwich. What? Make it yourself. Pseudo make me a sandwich. OK. Um, so why is this t-shirt so effective? Why have I seen this in so many places? Uh, it's because it answers three questions. One, what is your audience like? Two, what do they already know? What do they recognize? And three, what are you trying to convey? What do you need them to know? And in this case, with the XKCD comic for Pseudo Make Me a Sandwich, um, the audience likes uh, black t-shirts and hacker culture. What, what do they already know? Um, the audience is programmers, so they know about um, they know about the pseudo command and root administrator privileges. And in this case, what do you need them to know? Well, this is brand awareness for the XKCD comic, so the brand um, is being conveyed. So if you answer these questions uh, successfully, you will have created a sense of community and awareness around your design or your T-shirt, and that is cool. So here's an example of a t-shirt that I really like. It's Grace Hopper has a posse. Uh, since 2014, about two years, the company Bug Crowd has printed almost 3,000 of these t-shirts. And they've sent them all over the world uh, to different events. And the Grace Hopper Conference has gotten a bunch of these t-shirts. Um, and people in general just like it for these three, answering these three questions that I've already mentioned. So what do, what, uh, what do hackers like? They like black t-shirts. They like witty computer-related expressions. Um, what do they already know? And in this case, they know that Grace Hopper was a legendary badass computer scientist and that she's super cool because she has popularized the expression it is better to ask for forgiveness than permission. And they know her for her, her hacker mindset. 
So hacker, hackers like the hacker mindset. This t-shirt is popular for those reasons. And in this case, our third question, what do we need to convey, is very subtly explained as this is a brand awareness shirt for the company Bug Crowd. The Bug Crowd logo is on the shirt as well on the other side. So very subtly, with the minimum amount of information that we need to convey, and as much as we can of the what we want, what, what they like, and what they know. So in this case, those that recognize Grace Hopper feel a sense of community and like they are part of this club, um, in this case a posse of people. Um, so the, it's also a conversation starter and in this way it creates a viral spread of this campaign idea. If you don't know who Grace Hopper is, you might ask the person wearing the shirt and then they explain it and then you do know and now you're part of the group. So in that way it was a very successful t-shirt campaign and a very cool shirt. Um, these are the logos for some of the other shirts that uh, we have done. On the left you have our trust team shirt. So everyone on our team got one of these shirts and this works for answering the three questions. Uh, the first question, what does our audience like? In my case, my team is very interested in Hawaiian culture. We really like um, beaches, surfboards, flowers, and our company has a lot of this decoration around, and everyone at the company knows this. This is part of our culture. So it was very easy to say that uh, at Salesforce we like Hawaiian t-shirts. Um, but what is it that I already know that makes this shirt successful? I already know that this is a shirt advertising the trust team. That's the name of our team, so it says trust. So it's a, a subtle way of com communicating as subtly as possible the bare minimum amount of information that I need them to know, which is that the trust team is existing and that I'm a part of it. But mo mostly focusing on what do people like. And it can be anything. So in the next example on the right side, again, we're using the same Hawaiian culture hibiscus flower t-shirt design because it's the, same it's the same question, what do people like? But in this case, it's a black t-shirt because it's what do people like, um, hackers like black t-shirts. And this is our bug bounty program researcher appreciation swag. So we send this shirt out to bug bounty participants that have sent us cool bugs. And we are very appreciative of that, so we wanted to send them a t-shirt that would bring them into our community and allow them to be in on the, in on the story. So the t-shirt the just says, respect the research, and it's for researcher appreciation. Another one that we did um, on the left side is a t-shirt that has a, uh, an old TV show test pattern, and instead of the original numbering, we put in a bunch of um, cipher code so that if you were to translate all of the letters, it would have a secret message and you'll have to catch the slides later to solve the puzzle to figure out what the message is. Because the idea is that we want you to feel drawn in to become part of the community. So we've able to include as subtly as possible our branding and the information that we need them to know, which is the name and date of the conference. But the rest of it is just including uh, what do what is a hacker con audience like and what do they already know? And they already know in this case how to solve a simple cipher. On the right side, we have another uh, Salesforce security team um, swag shirt for the team. In this case, I just wanted to use this as an example because I wanted to bring home the point that what is recognizable and what the uh, audience already knows can be literally anything. It doesn't have to be cyber security related. It doesn't have to be green terminal code text. It can be anything that is recognizable. And you're just like in the example of Hackers the Movie where they incorporated uh, music and fashion and computers all together and brought them together. You can literally put anything on a shirt as long as it's recognizable and interesting and then incorporate that into the message that you're trying to convey in this case that the trust team is a community that we are all a part of because we have the shirt and it's a conversation starter. The conversation that we want to start in this case is, um, is 
that Salesforce is hiring. So we want the conversation that people have to be, how do I get that shirt? And then we say, well, you have to join our team to get that shirt. And they say, what does the shirt mean? And it says, uh, the trust team saving dolphins on their birthdays since 1999. It's supposed to be a little bit meaningless unless you know the story behind it. And you can't know the story until you join our team and then you hear all of the classic stories. So uh, in this way, we were able to um, build our community and start some conversations. Um, it's also our attempt at starting a new meme. Uh, it's easier said than done to start a meme on purpose. Uh, so we've been trying to circulate these images around internally for a while, and it has mixed results. Um, so I don't have any advice for you about how to start meme culture, but this is, in my opinion, a cool t-shirt. So just to wrap everything up and give you the takeaways, what we've covered today, give your audience credit. They've been seeing hackers for years. Don't assume that it's because that they're doing something because they don't know not to. Ask the five whys and figure out what the behavior that you really need to solve for actually is. Create a security culture program. It's a method of creating an ambiance of security. Create designs that you would want to wear, because sometimes you're going to have a lot of extra t-shirts and you will be wearing them yourself. <laughs> and uh, I just want to empower all of you to know that you do know what you like. You know what a cool t-shirt is. And if you would want to wear it, then others will as well, I promise. The cool factor is telling your story, is telling a story that your audience is in on and recognizes that they belong with. So that's my talk about how to make a cool t-shirt. Uh, thank you all for going through it with me. If anyone is a security awareness practitioner, I would really, really welcome you to email me. We have a, um, a security culture council working group that we've started that I would love to uh, discuss more with you. So please send me an email afterwards or I'll be in the back and uh, wanting to talk more about that. That's my talk, thank you.